It was a pretty normal thing for guys of my generation to spend at least one semester in 7th or 8th grade in shop class. That's where most of us built our first set of shelves. They weren't shelves like this. They were more likely shelves like this. But I remember being quite proud and I learned how to use a saw and make a dado cut in the end panels to hold up the shelves. So overall it was great experience, but that was kind of the end of my woodworking until my interest was renewed years later in my college days. I had a call from a customer around Christmas who wanted to know if I could build some shelves for them in a home that they had just completed a few months earlier. So here was my first look at their job. They are big time collectors of nativity scenes and among other things, they wanted to be able to display their collection a little more easily. At first we started out with the idea of floating shelves, which I've done a lot of work on and I was kind of looking forward to applying the technique I used in the video linked in the corner to their job. But then she sent me this picture and all of a sudden the job went from one that was pretty simple and straightforward to one that's a lot more complicated. So I did a variety of drawings for them to explore some of the options that would go with the style of cabinets they had. The ideal thing would be to build these on site and in place, but that was not really practical for a couple of reasons. One is that they were living in the home, and so that would be a major disruption for them. Two, we live about 40 minutes apart, and I had a commitment to start another job about three weeks later. So anyway, I decided that I needed to build the shelves completely in the shop and then take them out and install and trim them out on site. That would work best for everyone. The only issue is that I was going to be overlapping two jobs, which I hate to do, and that would mean working a lot of nights and weekends in the process. I used to be able to say, yeah, you're only young once, but since I'm not really young anymore, that reasoning doesn't apply here. So I said, okay, let's just do it, and maybe this will be the last time I double up and work on two jobs at the same time. Time will tell how well I hold up on that goal. The best approach to getting a nice paint job on the parts is to paint as much as possible before I start assembling the units. Using a roller that's designed for cabinets gives you a great finish, and though it's not as good as a sprayed finish, it's pretty darn close, and certainly a lot more manageable and less messy than spraying on the finishes. I'm rolling three coats of satin paint on everything. My original thought was to build the units in a real traditional way using dado and rabbit joints to lock all the parts together. So I did that on the first unit. It was actually a lot of tedious work and calculations to cut all the parts to the proper lengths to make all the dimensions work out, compensating for the dado joints. I thought it would give me a better overall strength because we were going to have to move these things quite a distance to install. And while all that's probably theoretically true, it was also just a bigger pain to do than was really necessary. So on the second unit, I decided to use pocket holes for connecting the main components together, which is a newer method, but also very effective and a lot faster. I couldn't really tell the difference strength-wise between the two units when we were actually moving them and putting some stress on all the connections in the process. And I think I actually got a little better and cleaner connections using the pocket holes, and it was certainly a lot easier cutting and assembling the parts when I wasn't having to worry about compensating for the depth of the dado cuts and all of my shelf calculations. I'm able to build these two units by myself by using clamps and various other methods to hold things together while I'm assembling, but I'm definitely going to have to have help and a lot of help to move them and get them set in place. In fact, it's actually going to take three of us to safely lift them into place on the base cabinets where they're going to be installed. One of the unique things about these shelf units is that we wanted them to look very solid as opposed to the look of adjustable shelves. We were looking for something that had more of the appearance of compartments. So that meant that the shelves and dividers needed to be a little thicker so the finished fronts would be the same thickness as the dividers and the shelves. The dividers turned out about two inches thick and the shelves about an inch and a quarter. So when the units were complete, after caulking all the interior corners with painter's caulk, the final coat of paint gave the units more of a look of a bunch of stacked boxes rather than individual shelves trimmed with a thicker piece of material. As you can imagine, with the addition of each shelf, the unit starts to get heavier. Each shelf is made of one piece of three quarter inch maple plywood with a piece of half inch particle board added to give it the thickness that we wanted. Both materials painted up nicely and the only downside is the added weight of the particle board you feel when you try to move the unit. 
The most important structural component to keep things square and limit diagonal racking as we're moving the units is the quarter inch plywood backing. The units are just under eight feet long, but the height is about 53 inches, so a single sheet of plywood, which is four feet wide, is not enough to cover the entire back of the units. So I needed to cut the quarter inch plywood and put a seam in line with the center of the top row of shelves. I used a couple of screws to hold the pieces in place while I made sure the backing was going to align okay. Then I pulled and painted the backing pieces prior to installing them permanently. The last thing you want to do at this point is to miss hitting the back of the shelves and dividers with the nail gun and blowing a hole in your freshly painted backing. So it's a good idea to double check your alignment and mark where you're going to shoot. I have an old staple gun that I've had nearly 40 years made by Sinco that has been absolutely reliable that entire time. I don't think it's ever misfired and the only maintenance I've done on it is to put a couple of drops of oil in it before I use it to keep the seals lubricated and that's it. I'm using staples rather than finish nails just to make sure the backing stays on. If I tried to take it off at this point after the staples, I would be tearing it off inch by inch. To this point, I've really done nothing except make square cuts and assemble different sizes of materials into what you see here. So this is not a particularly difficult build. The main thing I've tried to be particularly cautious about is making sure my dimensions are correct because if I foul that up and the units don't fit in the space when we take them to the job site, that would be an unmitigated disaster. Basically, there's no way to fix something like that on a project like this. At this stage, I'm down to building a face frame for this unit, or maybe said a little more appropriately, I'm trimming out the front edges. I start out with square cuts on all the edge material, and I have a shaper set up to work like a planer so that as I rip down the material on the table saw to the width that I need, I can go straight to the shaper and shave off the kerf marks from the saw blade all at one time. With my trim saw set up right behind where the box is being put together, I can make cuts and nail the trim pieces in place very quickly, which helps make quick work of this part of the job. As I said, all the cuts are square on the trim at this point, but I do take a trim router with a small 45 degree chamfer bit on it and run it around all the sharp edges of the trim. That gives the boxes a little more softness in the overall look. As I'm doing the final prep before painting the face pieces, there are a couple of options for filling the holes made by the trim nailer. I could use a wood filler, which is what I would definitely use if I were going to be staining the pieces, or I could use painter's putty. My preference is painter's putty, particularly since I'm painting the surface, and it's a little easier to use than the wood filler. To get these boxes the look that I want, I'm running a thin bead of painter's caulk into all the corners. This is the same thing I would do process-wise if I were caulking tile in that I'm putting a bead of caulk in the corner and then I'm wiping away with my finger, just leaving enough in the corner to make the joint disappear. In this case, the caulk is a perfect match with the paint, but if it weren't, I would use a touch-up brush and paint the caulk to make it blend in. After a couple of coats of paint on the trim, the units are ready to set. Once we got the shelves loaded and transported out to the job, it was just a matter of lifting them up on top of the cabinets and sliding them into place. The left side was particularly easy because there was no walls that we had to deal with, and with three of us lifting, it was easy. The right side was a little bit different in that we have a U-shaped space that has walls on the left and right. The corners were a little bit out of square, which I figured would give us some trouble, but the biggest problem was that the corner bead and drywall mud on the right side here was too much to let the cabinet slide into place. It wasn't an unexpected issue, so I was prepared with tools to deal with it, but I had to do more to fix it than I figured I would. I did have to take off about a quarter inch of the face frame to be able to get the cabinet to slide back against the wall. It took a little bit of time and we ended up with about an eighth of an inch gap when the shelves were back against the wall, but I had made trim pieces and had planned to trim out between the wall and the cabinet face anyway. The final touch was a three inch tall piece of cove that mounts to the top of the shelf units and matches the finish that the kitchen cabinets have on the other side of the room. So from my first shelf that I built in shop class in seventh grade to now building furniture pieces like this, there's been plenty of good progression. It's not that the skills have changed so much, it's just that 
I'm doing them on a bit bigger scale these days, but I get the same sense of satisfaction from looking at either of these projects. This stuff is fun. Thanks for watching.